Good. Good morning and welcome to the uh, regular session of Algon County Council. It is March the 12th, 2024, 9 a.m. and I will call this meeting to order. First order of business is the adoption of the minutes. Resolved that the minutes of the meeting held on February 27th, 2024 be adopted. Everyone's had an opportunity to peruse those minutes. If everyone's satisfied, I would entertain a mover and seconder, Councillor Hentz and Councillor Cookett. All in favor? And that's carried. I would remind members of any disclosures, pecuniary interest, and the general nature thereof. Seen. None. Moved into section four, presenting, uh, presenting petitions, presentations, and delegations. This morning, we are privileged to have the St. Thomas Elgin Social Services for the 2023 review and welcome Heather. It's good to see you today. Great to see you. Good morning, Warden Ketchba and members of council. We're thrilled to be here this morning on this beautiful day to review uh, for you and for the public, the the activities that have been happening in the county over 2023, and we're happy to answer any questions as we go through. So I've brought with us today a special guest who um, is the Director of Finance, and he's going to go over a couple of things that we haven't really done before, and I thought it might be helpful for you, especially um, because our contract will end at the end of the year and we'll have some negotiations to do. So I'm going to have Dan Sheridan come to the mic first, and again, we'll answer any questions as we go along. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just have a few slides to talk about the cost sharing agreement uh, between the city and the county. Um, yeah, we can get started, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so the the agreement was created in 2014, and it expires at the end of this year. It covers Ontario Works, Children's Services, and Housing Services. For Ontario Works, the cost share ratio for, for Ontario Works is based on the residential address of the person or family receiving benefits. The ministry tracks all this information. We get it in reports and we use that to, uh, to come up with the ratio for the county city share. Uh, the ratio is normally around 28.72. Um, it varies year to year, but it's approximately that. We don't have numbers yet for 2023. Uh, that'll be in a little bit. I just want to point out also that the admin funding for Ontario Works has been cut by almost $600,000 for 2024. And there's been some cuts to mitigate some of those for that funding cut, but there may be uh, some increases in the municipal share for 2024 in Ontario Works. Next slide, please. Get the next slide. Oh, there it is, sorry. Sorry, child, children's services. Cost share ratio for children's services is based on two components. First is the subsidy paid to families. And the second is the subsidies paid directly to child care facilities. For the subsidies paid to families, the cost share is based on their res the address of the residents, whether it's in the city or in the county. For the subsidies paid directly to the child care centers, uh, the share ratio is based on the location of the child care center. And again, it's around 70-30 normally, but it varies year to year. And also, the province has clawed back some funding for admin in child children's services. Um, there is some one-time funding to offset this for 23 and 24, but eventually down the line, we we'll, may see some increases 
of the municipal share for child care. Next slide, please. Housing stability services. Cost share ratio for housing services based on the subsidies paid to housing units in the city versus the county. The ratio has always been around 6436 area. Um, the housing for housing services, the, the municipal share is much larger than the other two services, the because the there just isn't the provincial funding for housing, so it's much big number bigger number unfortunately. Next slide, please. So administrative costs. So part of the uh, cost sharing agreement. There is a formula built into that to for the county to pay the overhead of the city. Um, it's kind of a, so the overhead is the um, it's the services contributing to social services that are not directly part of social services. So the other departments in the city treasury is a big part of it. There's no financial person in social services. So treasury does all the reporting and all the work for uh, social, social services. And those, those costs go into there through overhead. And the, the formula to calculate that was done in 2014 and it's kind of, it, it's not straightforward and it's based on programs, certain programs. And over the years, those programs change. So if the program disappears, the funding, the overhead costs related to the county also disappears with it. So over the years, it's kind of gotten skewed a little bit. So in this new amendment or this new agreement, we would like to uh, amend the formula so it's a little, so it covers the cost of the program. Uh, we will, city will contact the county through in the summertime probably to get the process started and uh, hopefully we'll have it done by the end of the year to take over. I think that's it. Yeah, that's all I have. Is there any questions? Well, thank you, Dan, for that. Uh, anyone have any questions uh, regarding the formulas or... Anything on the, yes, uh, Councilor Cookett. Thank you, Mr. Wardens. For you, uh, I believe that the county um, pays the, the, the city or the social services $1.7 million. I'm not sure what the, uh, what the city pays. Um, where does that money actually go? Does it go to pay for administrative costs, or does it go to pay for the you know the Ontario Works and Children's and Housing? How does that divvy up? It it goes for everything basically um, in all the different. So in housing, the largest part of that is housing. The county share, the well, around one point five in the past has been for housing. And a lot of that it goes to subsidies for housing in various places. Um, there's also admin component because the people administrating the administering the programs that we have to pay for that through that same process. So um, the answer is everything. There's admin mixed in. A lot of the other programs or Ontario Works and Child Care they have they give admin money. So there's it's a lot less to pay, but in housing, it's uh, there's a lot of it's a lot larger municipal share, and a lot of that goes to subsidies to housing. Councilor Crockett, thank you. I can follow up. Um, does does the I get. Uh, Delicate way to answer to ask this question. Does the, does the province? How much does the province give to social services in this in this area? Which particular area are you talking about? 
I guess all of them, I guess, you know, uh, Ontario Works and, and, and Children and Housing, I would assume that they pay for most of the money that you that you uh, that you grant. Uh, yeah, so Ontario Works, I, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I can give you some ballpark numbers. Ontario Works, the government contributes around $14 million dollars. For child care, it's in the area of $10 million, but housing is in the area of probably $5 million. So Ontario Works, the benefits are 100% covered by the province. Ontario Works benefits. We, we share in the administration of that program. Councilor Crockett, just just a final comment. I would like to um, uh, I would like to thank social services for the service they provided to Almer during the fire. We had a number of people that uh, had did, uh, uh, rented rooms above the the fire block, and uh, social services moved very quickly to help. So I want to thank uh, thank you, Heather, and and your group for for doing that for Elmer. Thank you. Any additional questions on the financing? Okay, Dan, before you go, just to clarify again, everything is historically based, meaning uh, the ratios you put forward today were based on 2022 actuals. Uh, I assume uh, the 2024 season will be based on the 2023 actuals. Uh, the budget would have been based on 22. Right. And then, because we don't, we have to set the budget early. We right. don't have 23 yet. So it just flows through if it's, then it, we even it out. We reconcile it every year anyway, right? It's just for the budget amount. Okay. So, so 23, when we get the actuals, it'll be set to the actuals that we don't base it on. It's only the budget that gets based on the previous years. All right. Thanks for that clarification. The admin side, of course, as uh, you had indicated, it's uh, apportioned out by uh, formula. And I assume that's based on those particular um, historical and then it's cost shared according to the use, right? Yes. Okay. Anyone else for any questions uh, with Dan? Okay. Oh, excuse me, Deputy Warden Jones. Hard to see you up there. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, through you, Dan. Um, with regards to the reduction from the province, do you have any indication of how much that is uh, being by percentage wise being reduced? It, 22%, I believe the number was. It is significant. Okay, anyone else? Great. Okay, thanks, Dan. Oh, sorry, I'm here to talk to you about the Interior Works program. So my name is Joanne Weber and I'm the manager of Interior Works. Um, so what I'm going to review with you is some of the key HASO demographics and talk to you about a brief update about employment services transformation. So on the left of the screen there, um, we have an average monthly OW caseload. Um, you can see the amounts there and it gradually keeps increasing. Um, our ministry is forecasted in 2024, there'll be another 5.9% increase and additional 8.5% in 2025. So in the middle, you can see the emergency assistance and emergency assistance provides one-time aid for low-income individuals and families facing crises. Like, and it covers things like food and housing um, and medical needs. And the monthly caseload for this is rising for two reasons. Um, one is the province loosened their eligibility criteria. And the second one is we found a way to maximize some of the dollars available. So we're using emergency assistance rather using, than we're using funding through housing. Um, so that allows that funding to be used for other purposes because emergency assistance, Ontario works, and I'm gonna talk about temporary care, all 100% provincially funded by the province. Um, so the monthly caseload um, 
for a temporary care assistant has increased as well. Um, and that's for parents who can't care for their children. So they're put in temporary care of another person. So often it's um, child is in care for safety reasons, children's aid is involved, um, or police involved, um, and the children aren't safe being in the parental home. So at the bottom are the, the yearly applications that we receive. So it gives you an indication of how many applications our office processes. Um, and on top of that, we also have started processing um, LEAP applications. That's through the Ontario Electrical Supply Program. And that's a grant people can receive on their hydro bill if they're in arrears. And that's for all low income families and individuals across um, St. Thomas and the county. Um, and we're doing that for Earth Power and Integris. So next slide. In 2023, 40% of the head of households had some high school education um, or less, while 60% had high school or post-secondary education. The family composition was 68% singles with a, without children, 27% singles with children, 2% of couples with children, and 3% are couples with no children. The anticipated changes that we see are an increased rise in singles. That's been a gradual increase and it keeps moving that direction. Um, so the, the people with children have decreased. And the age distribution as well as on that slide, um, the age distribution was under 25, 13%. The largest group is at 25 to 54 range. That's 75% of our caseload. And 55% 55, 55 and over is 12% of our caseload. So over the years, our caseload has begun has begot, gotten older than it has been in the past. And again, that's just a gradual increase. So the next slide, it shows a distribution of where um, the P individuals and families reside across the county and in St. Thomas as well. So this is based on December 2023. Um, on that particular month, 27% of people lived in the county and 73% lived in the, in the city. So on this slide, you can see that along with our St. Thomas office, we have two satellite locations. So a caseworker is available three to four days a week in West, West Lorne and five days a week in Elmer. So in February 2019, the province um, announced the launch of Employment Services Transformation, or EST, and it was implemented in our region on January 2024. So we're part of the London Economic Region. So that includes us, uh, Middlesex, London, um, and um, Oxford County is, is in that region. And the City of London is the service system managed for that area. Um, so we collaborate with the service system manager and our employment Ontario partners to assist individuals in finding employment or preparing for employment. So we direct, directly refer individuals to EO services and work together to support their employment and personal goals to help them um, find work when they're ready. On the next slide. So we support clients through various means, including connecting them with community resources, enhancing personal safety, health, and life skills for employment readiness. This involves raising awareness of available supports and services, addressing support needs, identifying individual needs to co-develop a plan to help people reach their employment or other goals, connecting clients with community services to enhance employment readiness, and tracking progress to ensure clients receive the necessary supports. So these efforts aim to prepare individuals for a referral to employment Ontario, resulting in, resulting in self-sufficiency. Any questions? Thank you, Joanne, for that. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Warden and Council. My name is Danielle Nielsen, and I'm the Manager of Housing Stability Services for St. Thomas and Elgin County. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you this morning to provide you with an update. So um, starting with social housing, this slide provides you with an overview, uh, according to the red dots, of where our social housing is located throughout our municipality. In total, we have approximately 1,100 units of social housing, with approximately 330 of them being in Elgin County. 
And in case the question's on anyone's mind, the answer is no, it is not enough. Uh, and we'll get more into that detail uh, when we talk about the social housing wait list. Next slide, please. So applying for social housing starts with an application. Uh, this application can be found online and completed, or it can be done in hard copy by visiting the social services office or by phoning the social services office and requesting that a copy be mailed to you. Next slide, please. So once that application is completed and processed, eligible households are added to our centralized wait list. To date, we have approximately 1,400 households waiting for social housing in our community. Uh, approximately 60% of those households are single occupants, while 40% are family uh, occupants. Wait times in our county and, and city uh, are anywhere from four years to 11 years, depending on the social housing that you're selecting. Uh, so this is not an immediate response for a family that is unable to afford uh, market housing. Next slide, please. So part of another way that our office supports our community is trying to help households stay in the housing that they have by bridging their affordability gap or their crisis. Uh, so we do provide emergency assistance for things like rent and utility arrears where it's jeopardizing the housing stability of the household. Our office can also offer rent supplements when they're available to eligible low income households to again offset the affordability challenge that a lot of uh, people and families are facing today. Next slide, please. So switching over to homelessness prevention, uh, what I'd like to share with council is that our response here for our municipality is rooted in best practices through Built for Zero Canada. Built for Zero Canada is a national movement that is supporting Canadian communities to incorporate best practices and drive down the number of people who are experiencing homelessness. And this slide provides you with a timeline of our Built for Zero work, including our achievements uh, in our municipality. Slide, please. So this slide uh, represents the data of one of those best practices, which is called a by name list. A by name list is an active list that's updated daily by community service providers uh, so that we know people by name who are actively experiencing homelessness. Uh, this is important because it allows us to use real time data to make decisions and to match people into uh, housing opportunities and resources. This was implemented in July of 2020, and since implementation, approximately 630 people have been identified as actively experiencing homelessness. I'm very happy to share with you that uh, approximately 65% of all households and people identified have been supported to move towards housing, which is a really incredible stat uh, for uh, current status around homelessness in our country. Uh, and this slide provides you with a breakdown of uh, total households identified, uh, and then uh, to the side is how many in Elgin County specifically. Next slide, please. So the other best practice in homelessness prevention that I am happy to share with Council that we've incorporated in our community is a coordinated access system. So a coordinated access system allows for community service providers to come together in our county and city. It happens bi-weekly to review the by name list, look at available housing options and resources and intentionally match people from the by name list uh, to those resources and housing opportunities. And there's a, <clears throat> pardon me, there's a link on this slide if you're curious to read more about how our coordinated access system uh, operates in our, our municipality. Next slide, please. And so specific to Elgin County, I'd like to highlight the really great work of Family Central, the Family Central, as well as West Elgin Community Health Center. So the Family Central in Elgin offers a number of community resources, including supportive housing, food security program, access to supports and services, and in the winter, they operate an emergency winter shelter as well. And on the other side of our county, West Elgin Community Health Center employs a rural homelessness system navigator for the entire county. That person is mobile and able to attend and support households that may be at risk of experiencing homelessness to, again, help uh, stabilize their situation and move them towards housing stability. They also operate an emergency accommodation fund. So in situations where someone may require financial support, for example, for a short motel stay or to offset a financial challenge that's jeopardizing their housing stability, they have the funds to be able to do that. Uh, in addition, West Elgin Community Health Center oversees an affordable housing committee, uh, which is a committee made up of community stakeholders politicians and invested community members who meet regularly to look at ways to be a part of solutions for increasing affordable housing options in our rural area. 
And uh, just quickly looking ahead, our intentions in our service manager role is to increase the number of supportive and affordable housing opportunities through advancing housing projects, including in the county, continual improvement of our best practices to move people out of housing instability and towards housing stability, and working to achieve functional zero, which is a term used by Built for Zero Canada, which essentially is defined as three or less people experiencing homelessness at any given time in a situation where there's enough resources to ensure that that experience of homelessness is rare, brief, and non-reoccurring. Are there any questions before we switch over to children's services? Okay, thank you, Danielle. Uh, any questions? <clears throat> Daniel, um, of the available housing stock, uh, social housing stock, what's the current occupancy rate? Is it 100%? Is it 90%? It would be close to 100%. So we do have turnover situations where a family or a person may leave and some work needs to be done to that unit before we can match a new tenant in. So that would make up a small percentage towards the top, but it is pretty much completely occupied on any given day. Okay, thank you for that. Yes, uh, Councillor Hans. Thank, thank you, Mr. Warden. I have a question. Uh, I'm looking at the root cause here. Is it an unemployment issue or just wages not keeping up with inflation for a lot of these folks? Of inflation uh, and wages not keeping up, but the issues surrounding homelessness itself is quite complex and is often rooted in other um systemic challenges like deep poverty, uh, colonialism, mental health and addictions, uh, and often at the root of the cause of the people experiencing homelessness that I've had the privilege of working with, it's usually trauma. Yes, Teresa, Councillor Tellier. Good morning. Thank you, Janelle, for your presentation. Uh, I've worked, had the pleasure of working with you on several projects, as well as the Homeless uh, Committee with West Oakland Community Health Center. So thank you for coming today and presenting to us with this important information. I have just have a question. I know it would be a long list, but what is one key thing, if you can think of, us as, you know, this tier of po uh, politicians can do to advocate for people who are uh, experiencing uh, some struggles with homeless uh, being unhoused and and uh, getting in where they need to be to have housing. Thank you very much for your question, uh, Councillor Tellier. Um, and uh, I think there's two areas that I would recommend that council focus on. Uh, one would be in your own municipality, supporting the opportunity for affordable housing projects to move forward. That can be challenge on a couple, challenging in a couple of different ways. One, of course, there requires a financial commitment. Uh, by council and by municipalities to advance projects forward. It also means encountering sometimes nimbyism, which means not in my backyard. Often local community members um, who may not fully understand the housing crisis we're in or the needs of low-income households would choose not to have affordable housing in their community. And sometimes you can come up against comments and challenging conversations of that nature, but I would encourage council to forge ahead uh, because affordable housing is so important for all members of our community, including the economic health and development and growth. Um, so that would be one area. The other is prevention. So any opportunities uh, to um, educate and encourage community members to reach out to social services for support ahead of being in a housing crisis so that we can mitigate and look to stabilize where they are now and make that stable uh, into the future for, for families and households. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Warden and members of Council. My name is Teresa Slowski, and I'm the manager of Children's Services, and I'm here to present uh, some information with regard to childcare in uh, in the county. Um, I do want to say that I did provide quite a few slides and I'm not going to go through every single one to the detail. I just wanted to give you the information and I will touch on what I feel is important for you to know today. So this particular slide talks about the expansion that we've been doing in, uh, in the child care and I wanted to highlight um, what we've done in the last uh, two years. Um, in 2023, we opened up in, in Alderborough and Dutton the uh, new child care and uh, um, moved the uh, 
um, early on program and the nursery school program to that center that was in 2023. Um, we recently opened the new child care program for 15 children at St. Mary's West Lorne and Assumption is almost ready. Uh, we're just working on staffing to open that center. So those are the new centers that we've opened in our community and uh, we continue to build um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. Um, Home child care is also expanding. We've been working really, really hard. During the pandemic, we lost quite a few of our home child care providers, but we are working with our home child care provider. And we're actually meeting with them uh, later this week to talk about expanding further into the counties. Uh, a majority of our home child care, as you can see, are located in uh, in the larger uh, cities like Elmer and uh, St. Thomas, but we really want to expand uh, childcare into the East and the West. And so we will be working with them uh, to, to focus on that. So that's coming up in the very near future. Um, I do wanna just touch on the wait list. As you can see, the wait list numbers are quite large. And if, um, if you recall from the last presentation that I did back in, in October, I talked about the Canada-wide Early Learning Childcare Program, which is the $10 a day. Um, one of the um, unintentional consequences of this is the fees have gone down so much that we're seeing families who normally would pull their children out when um, parents would go on maternity leave or um, if they were a teacher and they weren't teaching this summer, those families would normally pull their children out of childcare for those periods of time when uh, families were not working. But because the fees have gone down quite, quite significantly by 52%, those families, or many of them, are keeping their child in the child care program. So the spaces are not kind of rotating and coming available for families that need care. So our wait lists are quite large. Um, we're working on expanding the number of spaces that we have, uh, but that is an unintended consequence of this. Um, next slide, please. Just a little bit about fee subsidy. We continue to support families with fee subsidy. And because the number of spaces is limited, again, with families coming in, our subsidy numbers have gone down. I do want to just point out with the expenditures, you'll see that for 2020, 2022 and 2023, the expenditures are quite high, but that expenditure includes the Canada-wide early learning portion. So it actually is significantly lower uh, because Canada-wide that the Seawell program is funding um, the spaces. So my next presentation will be a true reflection of exactly how much we are spending outside of the Seawalk funding. Next slide, please. Again, just some information for you about the Seawolf program. Every single one of our child care programs is a member of the system. So we have 100%, which not many communities have. We're very proud of that. I do wanna highlight the number for you of 701 new spaces. That's the number uh, that the ministry has targeted for us uh, to um, through the access inclusion framework. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. Next slide. Again, you can take a look at this information. It's just uh, information with regard to the cost of uh, child care. Next slide, please. So the access and inclusion framework is that whole piece around expanding the number of spaces that we have. So as you can see, um, and I mentioned before, our number right now is we are serving 13.6% of our population through childcare, and the target is 36%. So we have quite a bit of um, work to do. The ministry has uh, allotted us 701 spaces, and we're working on that. Um, I'll get you to uh, just move to the next slide. Again, this is just our plan right now, but our plan is very fluid as to where those spaces go. Um, and I'll address that again in, in a further slide. So with regard to our access and inclusion framework, we are, again, are working with the with our um, the team in, ch in children's services to really find where we can put these childcare spaces, how we can expand. Again, we've realized that um, there are some obstacles in, in the way to expanding programs. So we're really heavily looking on home childcare right now. Um, if you look at the last uh, the last uh, space there, you can see that we have 701 spaces allocated. And uh, as of right now, we have created 243 spaces over the last two years. So that leaves us the 458 spaces that we still need to target. Next slide. These are some of the challenges, and I did address these uh, in a previous in the previous presentation. Um, the ministry, as of right now, has not not allocated any funding. So um, the only way that we can actually build new spaces is if is if the provider, whoever they might be, actually has funds to build. We don't have enough money to, to build the capital. Um, again, our targets um, are, are very limited as well with regard to the for-profit. Um, our not-for-profit centers that, right, that we have right now are kind of maxed out to their capabilities. So a for-profit is the way that we can address this, but uh, we are limited um, in that respect as well. There's no new school uh, plan to be built. So again, there aren't gonna be any child cares going if there if we don't have new schools. Um, the last time I was here, I mentioned about the fact that we are having trouble finding appropriate commercial space. And what I brought for you, and I will leave this for you, is um, just a document that tells you exactly what 
type of space we need to build a childcare. So um, one of the counselors mentioned that um, if you knew you might be able to help us out to say, I know of this building, I know of this space that, um, that could be used for childcare. So what I've provided you with is um, different scenarios from an 88 space childcare, which would be similar to the one that was built in the city of St. Thomas for 88 children, uh, to a 15 space childcare, which is what is be what it was built in St. Mary's West Lauren. And it tells you exactly what is needed with regard to square footage, outdoor space. And so I'm gonna leave that for you. And I would ask that if you have an opportunity to take a look at that, if you know of a space, please do not hesitate to reach out because we would be happy to look at those space and see if it could be converted into childcare. So I'll leave that here. Um, and then the last thing, which is the challenge that we are experiencing right now with Assumption is the lack of qualified staff. Um, the ministry requires a certain number of qualified early childhood educators, um, as well as non-qualified that can make up the complement of the staffing. And we are just very having very, very um, difficult time trying to find those qualified staff. Competition from other child cares, other municipalities, child, um, school boards, and that's contributing to the challenges that we have. Next slide. Uh, special needs resourcing continues uh, to um, to rise. We have a number of families that are that are uh, have children with uh, diverse needs. Um, Children's Services has increased our um, funding allocation to support special needs by hiring another resource consultant, and uh, that is uh, impacting the centers in a very positive way. So we're excited that we are um, better able to support those families that need care. This is just a slide about early on in our service levels. And we're very proud to say that families are accessing our early on centers. Um, we are working very hard with them to really find different ways to get the information out to families, to bring them into the program so that we can um, share services and, and uh, connect families with other services that they might need. But the numbers speak for themselves. We, we are having a very big impact on our community. And the last slide that I just wanted to talk about was our work on our service system plan. We are spending time right now working with every aspect of our community to really understand better what the child care needs are. Between COVID and the Canada-wide early learning system, four years ago of child care is not what child care looks like now. So we really need to look at our plans moving forward uh, with this new kind of vision in place. So we have, and I've just kind of outlined what the different types of ways that we've been reaching out to the community, to our child care providers, to our leadership, to really, and our community partners to really understand what they can bring to our service plan, what we can do to collaborate with them. And so this is our plan for our, uh, our system service. And we will be presenting that um, within the next few months once it is completed. So I will open it up for questions if anyone has. I know I spoke very quickly with a lot of information, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, thank you for that presentation, Teresa. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Councillor Widner. Yes, thank you, Warden, for you to Teresa. We talked about the unintended consequences of what the, is that a prevention, is it spread out to the province everywhere? Or is it just like the local to us or? Our, um, and, and CBC just did something last week on it about families that uh, that are challenged with this. So uh, absolutely, this is something that is affecting everyone because everyone's rates went down by 52%. So regardless of what you're paying, your rates were cut by half. And so that really makes a big financial impact on families if they can afford more care or can afford to stay in for the whole year instead of just part of the year. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Well, thank you, Teresa. On behalf of the social services team and Dan, uh, thank you so much for allowing us to do this presentation today. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and Heather, thank you very much to you and your team for bringing this forward. Uh, it's an important field and one that, uh, you know, the county works uh, hand, in you know, hand in hand with the city. And uh, but thank you very much for administering this. Okay. Resolved that the 2023 review presentation from St. Thomas Elgin Social Services be received and filed. Do we have a mover and seconder for that? Councillor Noble and Councillor Cookett will second. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Section 5, Committee of the Whole. Resolved that we do now move into Committee of the Whole. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Noble and Councillor Widner, all in favor? That's carried, thank you. Section six, reports of council outside boards and staff. Six one, the warden's activity report. Uh, it's available for everyone's perusal. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Otherwise, uh, 
I'd entertain a mover and seconder to receive for information. Councillor Noble and Councillor Hentz. I had to jump the gun there for you, didn't I? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. 6 2. Uh, looking for the tree commissioner, the weed inspector for the quarterly report from July to September 2023. Good morning. Morning, Mr. Warden and Elgin County Council. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Um, I have a couple reports for you this morning, starting with my uh, quarterly report for the period of July to September 2023. Um, a total of 15 uh, applications were received for harvest under the Elgin County Woodlands Conservation Bylaw. That's up from eight the previous year. Corresponding uh, board footage and uh, acreage uh, rose accordingly as well. Um, four weed complaints were received in that period. Three of them were addressed by the landowners as they were uh, noxious weeds uh, and scheduled noxious weeds as provided by the province. Um, the remaining uh, complaint was for Canada flea bane. It's uh, my complaints I've received for that over the last few years have really increased, but it's not a unidentified weed on the noxious weed list, so it's not governed by the Ontario Weed Control Act. Um, most cases, though, when I talk to the landowners, they they agree to uh, take care of that or try to address it if they can. Um, as far as industry news, um, for those of you that were on council in 2020, this would be an update. Um, in 2023. Separate instances of uh, oak wilt were confirmed in Ontario, um, two locations in Niagara region and another in the township of Springwater. Um, oak wilt um, is a vascular disease of oak trees caused by fungus that grows on the outer sapwood. It, it restricts the movement of sap and nutrients up and down the tree system to the leaves and to the roots. Um, all oak trees are at risk, the species in the red oak group are most susceptible. Um, mortality can often happen in one growing season. Um, the fungus does spread by three different uh, methods. Trees growing close together often have interconnected roots and the fungus can transfer between that root system. Um, it can also spread by uh, sap feeding the nitatulid beetles. Um, when I was younger, we used to call those beetles the uh, beer bugs um, when we would go to uh, family functions, that type of thing. Um, and similar to many other tree diseases, oak wilt can be spread uh, through moving infected wood products such as firewood. So um, back in 2020, it hadn't been in um, Ontario yet or identified in Ontario yet, but what they were watching for it just outside of Windsor. So it's interesting that it uh, um, appeared in the Niagara region. So um, Canada Food Inspection Agency is the lead agency that deals with invasive species. They uh, have implemented movement restrictions on infected properties and are determining next steps. Um, it should be expected that if oak wilt is found or detected in, in or near Elgin County, that similar movement restrictions would be implemented. So I do have a couple of uh, um, links there if anybody is interested and wanting to learn a little bit more about the oak wilt. So any questions? Well, thank you, Jeff, for that report. Just one question on the oak wilt. Uh... Where is the origin of that uh, fungus? Where did it come from? Uh, it, it's the world? from sorry, it's uh, it's from Asia, as far as best of my knowledge. Yes, it has been in uh, the United States for a period of time. So, okay, thank fortunately, you it's that. a fairly slow mover. Hmm. Anyone have any questions on this uh, quarterly report? Okay, seeing none. Catherine, please. Results that the report titled Tree Commissioner Weed Inspector Quarterly Report, July to September 2023, dated March 1st, 2024, from the Tree Commissioner Weed Inspector, be received and filed for information. We have a mover and seconder plan. Deputy Warden Jones and uh, Councillor Hentz, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you. 6-3 from the Tree Commissioner Weed Inspector, the Tree Commissioner Weed Inspector fourth quarter and year-end report for 2023. Jeff, please. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I did join my fourth quarter report from last 
here with my year end report. So I omitted an industry news update in this report. Um, so I'll just go through the numbers. Um, a total of 15 applications were received uh, across the county from October 1st to December 31st, 2023. You can see the uh, numbers per municipality. Um, the volume uh, would uh, um, is also there as well in the number of acres implemented uh, or where these harvests took place are there as well. And you can compare them to 2022. Generally, what you would expect across the board there ratio wise. Um, a total of 61 applications were received uh, throughout the year last year. This is down from 90 in 2022. Um, and what's interesting with these numbers is the actual board feet is an increase um, in the harvested acreage is down a little bit or about where you would expect the acreage to be so, um, from 2022. Two applications were received to clear portions of woodland lands in 2023 um, for a total of about 1.1 hectares, um, about two and three quarters acres. Um, one application in Central Elgin was approved for clearing about seven or 0.7 hectares and another in uh, West Elgin for removal of about one acre. Um, a total, uh, both of those were approved uh, conditional upon adherence of the Elgin County no net loss policy. A total of six complaints uh, were received for weeds in 2023. Uh, this number is lower than in 2022. No weed destruction orders were issued in 2023. I did attend uh, the annual weed inspectors uh, conference uh, um, virtually uh, question and answer session and did an online certification course and did uh, attend a number of workshops uh, in 2023, including Oak Wood. Built, hemlock woolly adelgid, beech leaf disease, beech bark disease, and spotted lan lantern fly. I imagine, or I, I'm intending at this point in time, unless another uh, topic comes up, that uh, the spotted lantern fly will be my topic of discussion in the uh, industry news in my first quarter report for 2024. So if uh, there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff, for that re report. Uh, any questions? Okay, good job. Results that the report titled Tree Commissioner Weed Inspector Fourth Quarter and Year End Report 2023 dated March 1st, 2024 from the Tree Commissioner Weed Inspector be received and filed. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Widner, Councillor Noble will second. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Okay. Moving on the 6-4, Director of Financial Services, the Purchasing Card Policy. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Mr. Warden. Through you to members of council, the report before you is provided to outline the development of an internal policy for staff who may be conducting business using a purchasing card issued by the County of Elgin. Clear guidelines in the form of a policy related to the issuance and use of purchasing cards as a county has not previously existed until now. And as a result, the treasurer and staff have had to lean on interpretation of past practice as their only guideline. As purchasing cards become more of a necessity in doing business each year, the issuance and use of the convenience warrants a formalized policy that incorporates best practices and reduces risk to the county. Executive leadership team in conjunction with finance staff collaborated to develop the attached internal operational policy. The purchasing car policy intends to complement the existing purchasing policy without circumventing accountability for purchases within the purchasing policy. The intent of the purchasing card policy is to remove ambiguity and inconsistencies for users and further supports the expectations related to distribution, use, and reconciliation of purchasing cards. To ensure cardholders are fully aware of their obligations, they will now be required to read and sign off that they agree to adhere to the policy, including reconciliation of their card. Delegated staff who may reconcile the card on behalf of the cardholder, such as a clerk, will receive training and also will be required to sign off on their duty for this. Failure to follow the policy can result in revocation of the card. We have very limited card availability at this time and many outstanding requests for access to new cards. With the policy now in place, finance is proceeding to issue cards to senior leadership and provide training to support staff needs. 
this policy is provided today for council's information and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Does any, <coughs> excuse me, does anyone have any questions for staff on this? I'm assuming that everyone is comfortable. Uh, it's timely. It is, uh, I think, uh, a good step to have in the uh, in the, the framework, so to speak, giving some guidelines, uh, particularly for what is eligible, what's not. It's rid of any ambiguity. Okay, Catherine, please. Resolved that the report titles 2.3 Purchasing Card Policy dated March 4th, 2024, from the Director of Financial Services Treasurer, be received and filed. Do we have a mover and seconder for that? Councillor Hens will move. Councillor Widner will second. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, six five Manager of Economic Development and Strategic Initiatives, the Elgin County Tourism Signage Program Review. Good morning, Carolyn. Good morning, Mr. Warden. Through you to Council, uh, Elkin County launched uh, the current signage program in 2010 to improve road signage across the county. And under the current program, businesses can apply to Elgin County Tourism for roadside signage. You have probably seen these signs on county roads. They are headed by an Elgin County tab and, and it include up to three business tabs per structure. So under the program, there is an annual $150 fee per sign. And the original goal was to distribute the cost of the sign over a 10 year period. Uh, the signs have now outlived their 10 year lifespan and they're starting to show their age. So some of the structures are um, need to be replaced. Uh, some of the signs have faded. So we're, we're seeing this across most of our structures. So tourism staff met with financial services and engineering services to review the administration of the current program. And while the program has been successful, several concerns were noted. Uh, the program was expected to reach break even in 10 years. The program did not achieve break even until 2024. So that is five years after the anticipated break even date. The administration of the yearly fee has been time consuming from a staff time perspective. So this process requires multiple follow-ups with quite a few bills going unpaid. So according to the policy, signs can be removed if yearly fees are not paid. However, removing and installing signage has also become a challenge with few contractors willing to put up and take down the signs due to the high insurance costs. Uh, and the final concern uh, was uh, signage saturation. So based on human information processing models, if drivers observe too many of the same signs, they may no longer pay attention to those signs, reducing their effectiveness. And this can also result in distracted driving and can impact road safety. So as part of this review, staff took a look at what is happening in our neighboring municipalities. Uh, the signage programs in Norfolk and Middlesex counties are similar to our current signage program, but their criteria to receive signage is much stricter than ours. Uh, the province's tourism-oriented directional signing program also has stricter criteria than we currently do. So currently, we provide signage to a lot of retail and restaurants, and most of the programs that I review did not include general retail or restaurants in their list of eligible businesses. Uh, that said, these programs have been around for quite some time, and I reviewed a few newly developed wayfinding programs in the province, including the Prince Edward County Wayfinding Strategy. So they're definitely moving away from offering fingerboard signs to all businesses and are focusing on tourism experiences instead. So really focusing on those key tourism uh, attractions in the municipality. So since signage is a 10 year plus investment, we would like to align uh, with this new direction. And we anticipate that our neighboring municipalities will also follow, uh, move in this direction when they review their signage programs. So staff's recommendation is to move away from the pay to play tab system to create a new signage environment designed to create a sense of arrival for visitors, highlight key tourism assets and avoid sign and message pollution. 
This approach would efficiently guide residents and tourists to downtown areas and prominent attractions strategically placed at key decision points within the county's road network. For example, signage near a beach could direct visitors from the beaches and marinas to other noteworthy uh, features and areas, including downtown districts for shopping and dining ex experiences. So again, instead of directing to a single restaurant, we're directing to a dining district where there are multiple dining options available. So we are still promoting uh, our local uh, tourism attractions just in a, a little different way. So this approach would focus on planning, placing signs throughout the region to avoid clutter while still effectively guiding visitors. Priority would be given to attractions with greater appeal to visitors. Again, we would really be taking a look at that criteria. What is a tourism business. And that's something that staff would spend some time working on. So what criteria do you have to meet to, to be a tourism destination? Um, and so additionally, the program would prioritize and guide visitors to specific districts or population centers where multiple destinations and experiences are available. So in alignment with our commitment to effective wayfinding, selecting destinations and attract would be a crucial aspect of this program. Only market-ready destinations would be included in the signage, ensuring visitors are directed to experiences such as exploring retail districts, food districts, recreation and leisure areas, and visiting cultural sites and museums. And tourism staff would work in partnership with engineering services, our local municipalities, and tourism operators to develop the new signage program. And we would present this program along with budget considerations as part of the 2025 budget deliberations. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you very much for that report. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes, Councillor Widner. Yes, thank you, Warden. Um, just a couple of questions, you know, Carolyn. How would this work in the rural areas? Like we have a lot of really good tourism things in our township. Now, would they that be at a corner signs or would they? Like, a lot of these depend on 401. So you get out 401 to be notified as this way. So how would that work? So any uh, major tourism attractions in rural areas would still receive signage and we would work in partnership with engineering services to determine where those signs would be located. Just to clarify and add to that question, those major tourist attractions then would still be solicited for an annual fee to pay for those signs? We would need to determine that. So if we would do a hybrid of, you know, districts and then right. pay to play, but again, that's something that we would need to determine what that structure would look like. Okay, thank you for that. Anyone else? Yes, uh, Deputy Warden Jones. You're muted, sir. Sorry. Um, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, this uh, seems like a better option uh, going going forward. Uh, it seems like a, a really positive step to me. Thank you for that. Anyone else? I am gratified that you have explored what's going on around us and even reached out to uh, some of the more innovative thoughts out there. Prince Edward County, you mentioned. So thank you for that. Uh, there are no further questions. We'll have the question. Resolved that the Elgin County Tourism Signage Program be put on hold until a new tourism signage program has been developed and that staff be directed to create a new tourism signage program that aligns with option number one and that the implementation of this program be considered during the 2025 budget deliberations. We have a mover and seconder for that. Councillor Cookett will move. Deputy Warden Jones will second. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Brings us to section seven, council correspondence, items for consideration. So 711, a letter from the Grand River Conservation Authority regarding the Lake Erie Region Source Protection Committee member nomination. Does anyone wish to speak to this? I think it's rather self-explanatory. Seeing uh, Deputy Warden Jones. Um, need to unmute again, please. Uh, 
Sorry about that. My uh, not used to this computer I'm using. Uh, I, I guess I could speak to that, uh, Mr. Orden, uh, since I do sit on the committee through Kettle Creek Conservation Authority. It's just a procedural. Uh, uh, people leave, people come and go on these committees, and it's just uh, replacing a person. Thank you for that. Okay, seeing no further questions, Catherine, please. Resolved that the Council of the Corporation of the County of Elgin supports the nomination of Alex Piggott, Manager of Environmental Services at the Municipality of Central Elgin as the Municipal Representative for Group 7 on the Lake Erie Region Source Protection Committee. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Noble will move. Uh, Councillor Tellier will second. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. 7.1.2, email from the office of the Honorable Todd Smith, Men Minister of Energy, and background around Bill 165, Keeping Energy Costs Down Act. Council, you've had opportunity to see this. Uh, what's your pleasure? You can either receive it for information or choose to take action on it, whatever you prefer to do. Wow. Councillor Cook it. Let's receive it for information. Wonderful. Moved by Councillor Cook it. Seconded by Deputy Warden Jones to receive for information. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. 7.1.3 the resolution from the Council of the Corporation of Tay Valley Township. This is one where they're declaring a uh, climate change crisis. Probably a good idea to uh, receive for information as well, but I'll let council decide that. Councillor Noble, willing to move that? Yeah, I received for information. Thank you. Do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Cookett. All in favor, that's carried. We have nothing for the consent agenda. And we're coming up on uh, resuming presenting petitions, presentations, and delegations. Can I recommend we take a uh, short comfort break before we get into that? So five, 10 minutes? Okay, let's recess. All right, welcome back. Uh, we left off at other business, so I'm going to ask members if there are any statements or inquiries by members. Is there any, or are there any notices of motion? Matters of urgency. Okay, seeing none, we'll now move on to section nine. Presenting petitions, presentations, and delegations continued. 9-1, uh, I'm looking forward to this presentation from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada regarding the solar eclipse. And Peter, thank you for being here this morning, and I look forward to this presentation. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Jedeke, and I am a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada London Centre. And we are here today, I'm with my uh, colleague, Steve Imry from the, and we're here today to talk about this rather special event, which um, I have decided to call a dark hole in the sky, which is what the solar eclipse will feel like if you've never seen one. It's really quite uh, an impressive event. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do today is, is 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the science. I'll, I'll mention some of the inspirational sides to the eclipse, um, and then I'll tell a few details. Um, safety is an issue, as always. Um, there's also opportunities that are connected with something like an eclipse, an event like this. And finally, I'll wrap up by talking a little bit about the resources. And just so you know, I'll be giving uh, this similar presentation at a few of the public libraries uh, over the next couple of weeks and in London as well. So um, the, move on here. Actually, I did want to say one last one other thing about that photo that was there just a second ago. That was taken by a St. Thomas person in our club uh, at the 2017 total solar eclipse. And uh, John has passed away. So I just want to kind of remember him uh, fondly. Anyway, so let's move on here. So what happens in, a, in an eclipse? So here we have a couple of technical words. The main one to think about is the word umbra. Uh, the big yellow ball is supposed to represent the sun. And the blue object there, you could think of it as the Earth. Or in this case, the moon is more important. But it really is any object. What we should remember is that every object in space casts a shadow all the time. That's a good way to remember this. A lot of folks get confused about where the uh, eclipse comes from. If you think about the fact that there's always a shadow behind every object all the time, and if you're in that shadow, in the umbra, you're not going to be able to see the sun. And that's what an eclipse really amounts to. OK, so in the, in the case of a solar eclipse, as we're about to witness here in a few weeks' time, this diagram does a better job of kind of giving you a sense of the activeness of how the eclipse works. There you see the Earth, recognize it because of the map on there. The moon is over on the right. The dotted line represents the moon's motion. Just to uh, set your mind at ease, there are no dotted lines in space. Somebody just drew that on the graph there to help you out. And the sunlight is coming from the right on the screen, and it forms this dark cone that you see as the shadow there. And as the Earth turns and the moon moves, the dark cone forms a path of an eclipse going across the Earth's surface. That path is generally only something like about 100 kilometers wide. You have to be inside that path in order to see the dark shadow of the moon fall across you. Now, on the other hand, there's also a partial region, which is shown here as a reverse cone getting wider from the moon. It's as a lighter blue there, and it gives a much larger patch on the Earth's surface. What ends up happening is folks make the mistake of thinking that they've seen an eclipse if they're in that larger patch, which encompasses millions of persons, as you'll see for this particular eclipse in detail. There is a little bit of a technical side to this. The moon coming between the Earth and the sun happens every month. The moon goes around the Earth. Why do we not get eclipses every month? And this is a little more technical side. The moon's path around the Earth is tilted so that most months when the moon is between the Earth and the sun, it's actually above or below. And so that means it doesn't, the shadow doesn't fall on the Earth. So only at a couple of times during the year can the shadow of the moon fall on the Earth's surface. And that's what we get when, the total, when a solar eclipse happens. Okay. All right, so here's a few, and the photo is from the 2019 uh, total solar eclipse in Chile, and it basically is a multiple exposure showing a bunch of different uh, moments during the eclipse, with the total solar eclipse being the one right in the middle. It gets dark. It doesn't quite get as dark as full nighttime because of that 100 kilometer roughly width that I mentioned to you a few minutes ago. The, uh, there's a kind of a sunset effect all around you. Um, which is part of the thrill of it. In any case, it's dark enough that some of the automatic things kick in. For instance, street lights might turn on. Uh, you'll see things like um, animals, birds will start to change their behavior. They think nighttime has occurred. Uh, that's something that some folks are really interested in and kind of have made studies of. Uh, you'll also see, if you want to really get some excitement on this, Go to the YouTube and watch a video of a past eclipse, and you'll see how folks start screaming and crying and laughing because it's so impressive, an event to see. Quite impressive. Okay, now that's the total solar eclipse and the center. On either side of the total solar eclipse, you only see a partial eclipse, and that's not nearly so dramatic. Okay. It, if you're interested in this kind of thing, when it's at its darkest during the total solar eclipse, 
the, uh, there'll be at least three planets visible. And in fact, recent news is that there's a comet that'll be between where the moon sun is and where Jupiter is. Uh, and you might be able to see that. It might be bright enough to see with the unaided eye. It's worth, uh, if, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Okay, uh, move on. Some poetry. Uh, the, the poetry is what inspires human beings, of course. This photograph was taken during a partial eclipse just a couple of years ago up at Western University on the campus. That's uh, the two famous buildings at Western and the partial eclipse rising in between. I've heard it said that this is the most beautiful photograph ever taken uh, on Western's campus. And as a, because I'm interested in astronomy, you got my vote for that. Anyway, that was in 2021. We do hear that eclipses are rare. Partial eclipses in any location are not nearly as rare as total eclipses. So that's an, an also worth noting. When the eclipse is total, when you're in that dark shadow of the moon, there's a few interesting things to look for. First of all, the hole in the sky effect is really quite amazing. We know the sun's this big ball of gas, and we think of the sun as really huge, but really in our sky, the sun's not that big. But when it's blocked by the moon, you get this incredible sense that there's a hole in the sky. And you think, wow, the whole, everything's getting sucked into this hole. It's really quite an impressive thing to witness. Around the moon's disk, the outer layers of the sun, which are normally not visible, become visible. And this is called the corona. It's a bright glow. At the very edge of the disk, there are wisps of gas that stick out, uh, pinkish, that are called prominences. Generally, you need some kind of uh, assistance, like a telescope, to see those, but it's worth knowing that they're there. And perhaps the most significant thing for personal experience is that during this brief time when we have total solar eclipse, it is completely safe to look at because the sun is blocked by the moon. So that's a completely safe thing to do. There's also a phenomenon called Bailey's beads, which is the twinkling of the bright sunlight in between the mountains on the edge of the moon. Now, they're very bright, so you really want to have some sort of protection during that phase, as I'll mention in just a few minutes. And then the next thing to look for is called the diamond ring. And the diamond ring, yeah. the diamond ring effect is also caused by a tiny sliver of sunlight at the edge as the moon either moves in or moves out uh, of the situation. And it gives you this beautiful effect of a diamond ring with the corona forming the rest of the ring and then the bright spot being the little sliver of sunlight that's there. Okay, now partial eclipse versus total eclipse. We've mentioned that briefly just now. The graphic that I'm using here shows four shots of the partial eclipse before and four shots after the total eclipse in the middle. And then the lower graphic really shows what happens when there is no total eclipse. When there is no total eclipse, it's just called a partial eclipse. And you even get certain events when the moon is a little farther away and its disk is smaller so that there is a ring of sunlight around the edge. And that's what happened in London in 1994. That's a picture of me at my house uh, with the uh, telescope sh showing the ring around, this, uh, around the moon in the uh, 1994 eclipse. So it, it's kind of important to know those different types, but of course you really want to focus on this particular event. All right, let's, let's move on. There is a, a lot of history to go along with this. You're going to be joining that history now. Uh, one of the earliest government funded ecl eclipse expeditions was in 1905 when the Canadian government paid for a whole bunch of folks, scientists, to go all the way to Labrador. It took them weeks to get there. Overcast, they didn't see a thing. It's the kind of frustration you have to deal with in astronomy. All right, so here is the details for this eclipse that's coming up. And this is an animation that was actually made quite a few years ago. It's almost amusing in the fact that the graphics doesn't look modern, but it gets the idea across. You see the Earth's disk and it loops. So there it is starting. The grayish area represents the partial eclipse. The black dot represents the total eclipse moving across Mexico and the US, and then it comes across Eastern Canada. And this whole process takes about three or four hours. At any given one location, it's just a few minutes 
of total eclipse, including an hour or so on either side of partial eclipse. And that's what you need to know so you can be prepared. Here's the map that shows our local circumstances. The uh, center of the eclipse is the red line that comes up through Lake Erie, cuts across Western New York, and then heads out to Newfoundland, bit of the total phase of the eclipse. If you are inside those purple lines, you will see the total solar eclipse. If you're north of the, that line, you will only see a partial eclipse. And you'll notice, of course, that London is in that area. I've highlighted London, and it gives the little details. This is a really excellent website, if uh, you're able to find it. You can pick any location, your house, or any other place where you might be considering going. Click on it, and it'll tell you exactly when the eclipse starts, how much partial eclipse you'll get, how much total eclipse you'll get. The only thing it won't tell you is the weather, and we'll deal with that in just a moment. Okay. For Elgin County, your staff has prepared a list of times at these four locations, and that is on the website so that folks can refer to this. And as you can see, they all are more or less starting around 2 p.m., lasting for about an hour until the total eclipse begins for a few minutes, and then another hour, and then the partial eclipse is over at about 4.30 or so. So it's an afternoon event, middle of the afternoon. And of course, that was the reason why the schools were concerned, because that's just around the time of day that the children would be released from school, and so they might be unsupervised. And so they, most of the schools have decided that they want to turn the children over to their parents for the whole day for that event. And this is also from your website, showing that uh, your staff has identified eight locations that might be convenient for folks to uh, stop in and see the eclipse. But again, anywhere south of that line that I showed on the previous map will get you the total solar eclipse. If on the day something happens, for whatever reason, you're not able to reach Port Burwell or Port Bruce, anywhere, just stop along the side of the road and or even at home if you live in that area, and you will see the total solar eclipse. Now, it is a little bit interesting for you in Elgin County specifically because the edge of the eclipse runs through the county. So on the very north side of the county, the side that's closest to London, those folks don't get to see the total eclipse. They only see the partial eclipse. You have to be south of that line. Now, the good news is that the entire lakeshore in Elgin County is within the total area. So if you tell folks, go to the lakeshore, that'll get them to the total solar eclipse, okay? To prepare for an eclipse like this, you want to uh, be aware of what's going on, the times and so on that we've talked about. Be aware that um, going to the eclipse, wherever you choose to go, everybody has their own idea about when they want to arrive. It's a good idea to arrive early because that way you're there. But when the eclipse is over, everybody wants to leave at the same time. So the real traffic jams are after the eclipse, not before. And that's worth knowing. This was our experience in the 2017 eclipse. We showed up at this giant parking lot, the Walmart down in Tennessee, six hours beforehand and the place was empty. But when the eclipse ended, within, a, within 20 minutes, it was, a, it was a nightmare. And it took us six hours to get back to our hotel that day. Now, the big devil in all of this is the weather because we have no way of predicting that really. Uh, we don't know what the weather will be like. If the weather is like today, look out the window, folks. If you can see shadows, you know you're gonna be able to see the eclipse that day because that'll mean there's enough sunshine. Now, of course, even when the morning is as lovely as it is now, by afternoon, it could cloud over and be raining or snowing. We, it's hard to say. That's the way it works. Now, long range forecasts for this area are not optimistic. There's about a 70% chance that the sky will be overcast on that on, on any day at this time of year, 70% chance. So you've got about one chance in three that the sky will be clear. And I don't know, this has been a pretty friendly winter, so you might show some optimism that you'll beat the odds on that day. Diane and I will be down in Texas where the odds are reversed. We've got a two thirds chance of having clear skies in Texas and one third chance of it being overcast. And of course, I love this cartoon, of course, anytime we can get astronomy mentioned in popular culture, it's always exciting. And I did throw in one more, more slide about 
the weather. This is what the weather looked like on April 8th, two years ago. And you can see there's a total mess of clouds over the entire eastern region. A little bit of a gap in Lake Ontario. Kingston might get lucky on a day that was like this. And Texas is clear. So I'm kind of, you know, I'm smiling about that. But if that's what happens on the day of the, mo the morning of April 8th, then, you know, stay home, watch the eclipse on the internet. That's the best thing you can do. All right, now let's talk about safety. It's a huge concern, of course, and I know that your staff's interested in the public side of these things, but I'm going to talk specifically about the personal side. The sun is so insanely bright that if you look at it, your retina will be burned before you know it. Now, you know, how long does it take? Don't try. It's like a submarine. You don't want to go too deep and find out where it explodes, right? So just don't look at the sun ever. That doesn't apply just to eclipses. Some folks think there's something extra dangerous about eclipses. Not the case. The sun is dangerous to look at any day, even today. So what you need is some sort of protection, something that will block the sun out some way or let you look at it indirectly. And that's, of course, what I kind of want to tell you about. There's a unsafe methods that have been discussed many times over the years in past days are some of these ones list, listed here. Uh, none of these are safe, but I'm not even going to highlight them. You can have a quick look. This actually comes from a pamphlet that the Royal Astronomical Society put out back in the 1990s when the, the, uh, ring, the ring of fire eclipse took place here in southwestern Ontario. Okay, but let's talk about some of the safe ways. Indirect viewing means you're not looking directly at the sun. Instead, you're looking at some sort of a, an image, a, a, another look at the sun. That photo shows um, what the sun's crescent shape during the partial eclipse in 1994 looked like on our front door at our house. And what I did was, it's very simple, just take any mirror, small mirror, it does not have to be round. So here's a square mirror. And I could demonstrate this right now, if you wanted to take the time. I would walk out into the parking lot where the sun is shining. I wouldn't look at the sun. I would take my mirror and I would flash my mirror so that the sun came in here and I could put an image of the sun on the wall over here. You wouldn't know what it was because it would be a round yellow ball. Wouldn't occur to you that that's the sun. And you might think it's strange that I was using a square mirror because why is it round? It's because it's an image of the sun, not an image of the mirror. During the partial eclipse, you'll see it shaped like a crest. So indirect viewing is 100% safe so long as you don't look at the mirror, as long as you don't let the light flash in your eyes. You know, children, when they're being mean to each other, will do that. They'll flash a mirror into someone else's eyes. That's not a safe practice to do, okay? second one is called pinhole projection. And pinhole projection works kind of neat even in with everyday items. On the left, you see a photograph of a colander, which has little tiny holes in it. And you just hold the colander up, and it projects a hundred little tiny crescent sun shapes on the ground or on the wall or whatever you're aiming at. You can take a white sheet and put it on the ground to make a good screen for that. This is called pinhole projection. Okay, let's move on. A pinhole camera uses that uh, principle. And I'm not a craftsy person, but I love making these. You take a cardboard box, you put a hole in over here, put a little card over the hole and a tiny hole in the cardboard. And on the inside, you put something that you can see over here that goes over your head, back to the sun, sunshine comes through the hole and you'll see an image of the sun in here. Now, a lot of folks are pretty impressed with how simple that is, you can make one even smaller, make one out of a shoebox. You don't have to put your head inside it. You can just, there's the card, the little tiny hole, and there's a little hole to look in. So you back to the sun, the sun's over there right now. The sunlight comes through the pinhole and it, there's a little tiny image of the sun over on the screen inside there. What folks find disappointing about pinhole cameras is that the image of the sun is quite small. You're not looking at some big magnified Hollywood thing. Um, here's a pinhole ca uh, camera being used in the 2017 eclipse. That's Diane on the left. And I get a huge kick out of the photograph on the right. That's, uh, that was published in Life magazine in 1963. A whole class of children 
all with their homemade pinhole cameras and their heads stuck inside the cardboard boxes. It, it makes a great project and children love, of course, a project. And then what you can do is, of course, you can keep the, the pinhole camera. I built this one in 1994 and it served me well for like 60 clips. And you can keep your pinhole camera in the basement and it'll be there the next time there's new clips. They're easy to make. I only just made this one yesterday. So old, new, same principle, same design. Indirect viewing also could include projection of optical images. It's uh, a little more risky because folks often will mistake how they're holding the binoculars and you might get a glint off the sunlight as long as you're careful about that sort of thing. Also, the good news is that when you have the sun's light going through the binoculars, you get a larger image of the sun on the projected screen. But you also are at risk with the binoculars because sometimes the uh, binoculars will absorb so much of the sun's energy that they'll crack or something or worse, you know, they break in two. So you don't, you, it's, it's not highly recommended, but if you know what you're doing, you can use a binocular projection. There's also specialized telescopes that do this sort of thing. This is called a sun spotter. There's multiple reflections. And then you get a nice, large, convenient image. This is during the 2014 partial eclipse. Uh, and as far as I know, there's only two of these devices around. Western has one and Fanshawe has one. They're a little bit on the pricey side, probably not worth buying one just for a single event. But uh, there you go. It's, it's available. And it's a, it's a really interesting tool that was designed specifically for this purpose. Now, direct viewing. This is, uh, some folks will talk about glass. So this is a piece of welder's glass, shade 14. The welders tell me, I'm not a welder, that the welders tell me that they almost never use 14. So it's hard to get this kind of stuff. And uh, in fact, I only just opened it a few years ago. I had bought it years ago and always showed it closed. But here's, a, here's the same idea, um, only this time it's been put into a wooden frame so that it can fit over a camera lens. The idea is you can use the camera with this, but it has to be on the front of the camera, not on the back of the camera. So that the light is blocked before it goes into the camera. Always a good idea. The most popular tool is these so-called solar viewers a sheet of plastic that you look through, and it blocks off or reflects more than 99% of the light. Now, there is an international standard, and it's important that you don't get some cheap knockoff. There was a big controversy in 2017 when uh, Amazon sold a whole bunch of uh, fake eclipse glasses. And we have many of them here. Um, yeah, so in fact, I... I brought bundles of them. I can leave them in the, in the, in the office out front. The uh, public libraries are going to have want some to give away. They're also quite commonly sold on the internet nowadays, of course. And look for, look for the ISO standard printed on there. If it doesn't say ISO 12312-2, then don't use it. Here's the, uh, the glasses again. Um, one of the things that you want to know about the glasses is that you can't see anything else when you're looking through the glasses. So what you're advised to do is um, look down at the ground, put the glasses over like this, and then look up to where you know the sun is. And your eye will automatically see, oh yeah, there it is, there's the sun. It's, it's quite easy to do, but it, it's not a bad idea to practice ahead of time. So take your Eclipse glasses uh, today or sometime in the next couple of weeks and practice ahead of time. When folks use the glasses, we don't want them to make a mistake. We don't want folks to think that the glasses work when they're in your pocket. Right? There's a famous photo of uh, the former president of the U.S. on the lawn of the White House in the 2017 eclipse looking up without the glasses. I don't know where he had the glasses, but astronomers, of course, love to show that picture to supposedly show an unsafe practice. So, you know... Go ahead, be safe with this thing. In the 1994 eclipse, we gave some out to a class at one of the public schools in London. And I just think it's adorable, all the children looking at them. You can wear these glasses, you know, once you fold them up and put them on, I notice you've already got one right there. 
Um, but you don't need to stare at the sun for the whole hour and a half. It's boring to do that. You can share your glasses with someone else so long as you don't keep looking at the sun while, you're, while someone else has the glasses. So we don't need for every person to have their own set of glasses. You just need to be with a small group that has at least one set of glasses. If the supply becomes a problem, sharing is the solution. If you're interested in photography, it does get a little more complicated. This is an example here of a telescope that has a box on the front that's built with a proper shield. And our member Mohammed is uh, using his camera to take a picture. You can see on the camera screen, there's the partial eclipse of the sun. This is at the 2021 uh, partial eclipse. It does take a little bit of photography skill, so you know how to change the settings on your camera. But if you're interested in that sort of thing, it's worth learning. And so let's wrap up the talk about uh, uh, eye safety. There are uh, five common, commonly used sort of stages, phases of, a, of an eclipse. The partial eclipse, you need your glasses. The uh, diamond ring, it's a good idea to still have the glasses on because you're looking at a sliver of sunlight. The diamond ring is very, very beautiful. Bailey's beads, the little sparkles that occur just, be, just before the total eclipse starts and just before the total, sorry, yeah, and then just after it ends, in just a few seconds. Again, you want to have the glasses on because those little tiny sparkles are still pretty bright. And then during the actual total phase, which is the most impressive part, the most significant part, you don't need your glasses on for that. That is safe to look at. And then after the Total eclipse is over the partial phases last another hour or so, the glasses need to go back. All right, let's talk about the opportunities, of course. This is a hugely uh, widely known phenomenon. Folks talk about it. I think that deep down, it's because anyone who's ever seen one can't stop raving about it. It's such an impressive thing to see. That's why it just... People just don't ignore it. it it'll, be in, it'll be in the news. The disc jockey on your AM radio station on the morning of April 8th, if the sky is clear, the disc jockey will talk about it. And a million persons from Toronto will all want to get themselves south of that blue line on the map. That's the way it works. And so you can take advantage of that with uh, newspaper headlines and so on. Uh, one story that I particularly found amusing is that in 2017 in Salem, Oregon, they had a baseball stadium and they welcomed folks to the baseball stadium. Uh, in fact, April 8th turns out this year, the upcoming eclipse, turns out to be a day when in Major League Baseball there will be games held along the line of the total eclipse. Cleveland is the closest one uh, and they deliberately change the time of their game starting. They're going to start the game later in the day. I think they're going to start the game. I forget if it's an evening game or if it's a supper time game, but they're going to open the stadium at the beginning of the eclipse. So they're going to welcome fans to come in. It just means it's a shared community kind of experience. It makes a wonderful thing, of course. And so if you're into, if, you, if, you're, if, if your field is public, involvement at any level, whether it's libraries, parks, recreation, anything like that, this is worth knowing about and it's worth planning for. Something wonderful to celebrate, of course. Uh, there's a million things we could uh, show, all kinds of hilarious things that folks have done with eclipses over the years. I love the Oreo cookies being used to demonstrate how an eclipse proceeds. Uh, and in 2017, when we were down in Tennessee, uh, all you can eat moon cakes. That got my attention, that's for sure. Uh, I've also heard, I only heard this yesterday, but I looked it up and it was announced uh, at the end of December that the eclipse. Now, I wasn't able to find out, are they going to issue the stamp before or after the eclipse? Maybe they're waiting until after and then they'll use an actual photo of the eclipse perhaps. But you know that shows when Canada Post has a stamp, you know it's got people's attention. All right, resources to rely on. We, uh, if you have eclipse glasses, that's awesome. We're gonna leave some here at the office for you. We uh, have, a, of course, nowadays, the modern to watch YouTube videos of folks explaining eclipses. You can spend hours doing that. 
Um, there is, of course, your, your own website, Elgin County website, has a page devoted to the eclipse, which I've been linking to for anybody locally. We also have our Astronomy Club website has a page devoted to the eclipse, and that's what that QR code links to. So if, you were, if you're able to use that QR code now or at any time, um, that'll link you directly to our Astronomy Club page. Western University has a page devoted to the eclipse. And there are, of course, many, many others. Perimeter Institute in Waterloo has a page. Um, Mc, uh, McMaster at, in Hamilton. The Toronto, University of Toronto has one. In Kingston, Queen's University has one. Kingston is actually inside the, the line. I normally don't talk talk about the further east points because it's like a five-hour drive to Kingston and you know so what's the best thing for you to do you're in St. Thomas you're in the path of the total solar eclipse you don't need to do anything it'll be in your backyard so long as you're south of that line on the map you can wait until the morning and there you go the weather will dictate what's going to happen now if you feel you're more enthusiastic about it the total eclipse will last a little longer the further east you go. So if you get up on April 8th and you decide, oh, oh I don't mind, I'll, I'll make the effort, drive to Port Burwell or even further, drive outside Elgin County along the Lake Erie shore. If you're really keen on this and you're thinking about it the night before, then what you can do is leave real early. If the weather forecast, usually the weather forecasts are reliable, 12, 24, maybe even 36 hours ahead. So if it's bedtime on Sunday, April 7th, and you're keen on it, you think, oh, the weather forecast is good. Set your alarm for 6 a.m., get up at 6 a.m., pack a picnic lunch, drive as far east as you want along the Lake Erie shore, and stop basically anywhere, have a picnic, and wait for the eclipse. That's the way to enjoy it. And you will be impressed. I think that's the last slide. Couple, just a couple of summary points for Elgin County. If you're taking notes, I was gonna give you a test at the end, but I figured I'll, I'll let you worry about that on your own. Anyway, so of course, I hope we have time for, uh, by the way, you gotta get that clock fixed before the day of the eclipse. Otherwise you're all gonna miss it. Anyway, uh, if we if we have time, I'm I'm certainly here for for you to answer any questions, and uh, I can describe things in more detail. I can show you some of the uh, demonstration things that I brought along, and you know, if you all brought your scissors and your glue guns, I'll help you make a pinhole camera right here and now. <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much for that presentation, Peter. I was very enthusiastic and uh, a lot of information. I'm going to open it up to council members. Does anyone have any questions? As they say it's a once in a lifetime event coming to our shores. So take advantage of it and stay home. Are you all going to make an effort? If to stay home that yes. day? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have literally heard folks say, I don't care. It's a day off work. I'll stay in bed. <laughs> I've heard folks say that. But I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. I, I, it's it's hard to put it into words, and I've heard, I mean, I've heard people say that it is the single most impressive event in nature. Period. That's high praise. I've never stood next to a an erupting volcano. I'm not sure I want to, but if a total solar eclipse beats that, that's pretty important and pretty impressive. Okay. Uh do you have a question, uh, Deputy Warden Jones, or I don't think so. Councillor Cookett. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you very much for that presentation. I was very enthusiastic. I'm just going to, I'm going to sit back and wait for all the screaming and laughing during that time. You won't be one of them, I promise. <laughs> 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 Perfect. If, if, if anything else comes up, um, you can reach out either to me or somebody in the astronomy world will answer whatever questions you might have. 
Okay, well, thank you again for the presentation and uh, attending today. Uh, I was, I've certainly enjoyed the presentation. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, Catherine, please. Resolved that the solar eclipse presentation from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada be received and filed. We have a mover and seconder for that, please. Councillor Crockett will move. Councillor Widner will second. All in favor? And that's carried. Thank you. Brings us to 9-2, Manager of Economic Development, Strategic Initiatives, the Total Solar Eclipse. Carolyn? Thank you very much, Mr. Warden. Through you to Council, this is just a brief update on the planning activities that Elgin County Tourism has been engaged in for about the past year in getting ready for the total solar eclipse. So again, as Peter mentioned, uh, there will be a total solar eclipse on April 8th, 2024. And uh, we can go to the next slide. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, and in 2017, uh, the total solar eclipse in Oregon attracted millions of people. So these are events that uh, present an opportunity from an economic development and tourism per perspective for our community. So various media outlets have mentioned Elgin County as a prime viewing location. There have been several story stories on CTV London. Uh, I've noticed several blog articles uh, mentioning Port Stanley as a great place to view the total solar eclipse. So if you take a look online, there are quite a few different travel sites mentioning Elgin County as a location to view the eclipse. And again, astronomical events tend to attract more people than communities anticipate. Uh, so this is something that could potentially attract a lot of people if we have a good weather day. Uh, and so preparing for the eclipse began in May uh, 2023 uh, to ensure that residents and visitors have a safe and enjoyable experience. So at that time, I reached out to our local municipal partners and also to emergency management to uh, determine how we would like to approach this eclipse. Would we like to plan several viewing events? Would we like to map out the best locations in the county where visitors could come, park their vehicles, have access to washrooms and enjoy the eclipse? or uh, do nothing, I guess. Those were, were our three options. We went with mapping out those public locations where people can park their vehicles, have access to washrooms and enjoy the eclipse. Uh, and this was based off of several things. First of all, we anticipate that people are going to come regardless. So whether or not we are prepared for this, people are going to come. Uh, the best thing to do then is to make sure people know where to go. We want to make sure they know where to go across the county and that these locations have adequate parking and washrooms as well. And again, we did consider uh, hosting special events. These require a lot of staff resources as well, uh, which was beyond what we had the capacity support. So again, the goal is to spread people across the county at various different locations to enjoy that eclipse. All right, and leading up to the eclipse, we worked with the Royal Astronomical Society to develop a public awareness campaign. So the presentation that Peter just gave, he is also giving that to libraries across the county uh, this month. And uh, we worked with our local municipalities to finalize the eclipse viewing map. So again, all of those locations that are highlighted on the map, our local municipalities are aware of those locations. Uh, and we also launched a total solar eclipse website. So this website has different safety tips, um, different information about where you can view the eclipse and timing as well. We issued a media advisory in January of, or I think February 1st, 2024. And this was just to uh, raise awareness of what is happening in our community. We coordinated an order of eclipse viewers for uh, county and our local municipal park. Partners. Some of these Eclipse viewers are being distributed at our libraries, some are available at your local municipal offices, and we will have several, um, several hundred Eclipse viewers available at the Port Stanley Visitor Center on the day of the Eclipse. We also reached out to the business community to let them know that there may be an influx of people on April 8th. April 8th is a Monday. It's a day that sometimes um, that some of our businesses are closed. So again, this is a day that they might want to open for. And we hosted an eclipse information session similar to this one with the St. Thomas and District Chamber of Commerce. And we promoted that to all Elgin County businesses. We had businesses from West Elgin attend. We had businesses uh, from Bayham attend and everywhere in between. So we uh, 
promoted that to businesses across the county. Uh, we'll be again hosting Eclipse information sessions for residents at our local libraries. And we have also worked on a communications campaign for uh, March of 2024. So you'll be seeing uh, weekly messages about the eclipse on our social media. It'll say uh, where to view the eclipse, how to view it safely, and other emergency management measures. And then the day of the eclipse, we are opening the Port Stanley Visitor Center, uh, and a limited number of eclipse viewers will be available on a first-come, first-served basis here. And we have heard that there are events across the county that our local business community is planning. For example, uh, the Bacchus Page House is planning an eclipse viewing event. Uh, the Gailey Museum is planning an event, Natterjack's, Erie Gardens, and there are more. So again, our local business community is planning events and anticipation of uh, this event. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much for that report. Uh, it's it's interesting to note that you've been well, well, not quite a year, but 10 months into putting this together. So congratulations to you and your team. Uh, any questions from members of council? Seeing none, perfect. Resolved that the presentation titled 2024 Total Solar Eclipse from the Manager of Economic Development, Tourism, and Strategic Initiatives be received and filed. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Noble. Deputy Warden Jones. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. All right, that means we are now moving into closed meeting items. Resolved that we do now proceed into closed meeting session in accordance with the Municipal Act to discuss the following matters under Municipal Act Section 239-2. Closed meeting item number one, closed meeting minutes, March 12th, 2024. Closed meeting item number two, Elgin County Emergency Management Preparations under Section A, Security of the Property of the Municipality or Local Board, and Closed Meeting Item Number 3, LS 24-4 Land Ambulance, under Section F, Advice that is subject to solicitor-client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, and Section K, a position plan procedure criteria or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the Municipality or Local Board. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Noble will move. Councillor Hentz will second. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. Motion to rise and report. Resolved that we do now rise and report. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Noble will move. Councillor Hentz will second. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Motion for the minutes. Resolved that the February 27th, 2024 closed meeting minutes be adopted. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Widner will move and Councillor Noble will second. All in favor? That's carried. Closed meeting item number two. Resolved that the confidential report from the Manager of Emergency Management and Elgin Middlesex Regional Fire School be received for information. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Hentz will move. Councillor Noble will second. All in favor? That's carried. And closed meeting item number three. Resolved that the Council proceed with the land ambulance service level proposed in the 2024 budget, which sets a 12-hour ambulance shift at the Bayham Land Ambulance Station for the 2024 year. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Cookett and Councillor Tellier. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Motion to adopt recommendations from the Committee of the Whole. Resolved that we do now adopt recommendations of the Committee of the Whole. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Noble, Deputy Warden Jones, all in favor? That's carried. The bylaws. The 
the budget bylaw first. Being a bylaw to proceed for the adoption of the 2024 budget of the Corporation of the County of Elgin and to establish the 2024 tax ratios and 2024 tax ratios for the said corporation of the County of Elgin and its constituent lower tier municipalities. Resolved that bylaw number 24-07 be now read a first, second and third time and finally passed. Over and seconder, please. Councillor Hence, did I see uh, Councillor Widner? All in favor? That's carried, confirmation by law. Being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Municipal Council of the Corporation of the County of Elgin at the March 12th, 2024 meeting. Resolved that bylaw number 24-09 be now read a first, second and third time and finally passed. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Noble, Councillor Tellier, all in favor? That's carried. Brings us to the adjournment. Resolved that we do now adjourn at 11.43 a.m. to meet again on March 26th at 9 o'clock a.m. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Widner, Deputy Warden Jones, all in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much for joining.